Hi guys, welcome back to Freedom to Learn podcast. My name is uh, Guru Yelesh Varapu. I'm the founder and CEO of Silicon Valley for You. And uh, so, yeah, please uh, like and press on the subscription button so that you can get a lot of these content your way. So today uh, we have, you know, one of to me. I I meet her three to four times a week uh, on an average, and um, and you know I know she and her husband also very well. So um, she's one of the top entrepreneurs in Silicon Valley, and her name is. I hope I get it right. Um, I we call we call nicely Shai, so that's why it's difficult for me to say her uh, complete name. Shaha Dov Mudakabi. Correct. She is that. <laughs> so, uh, so, uh, so she. Some might say she's an accidental entrepreneur, um, and uh, and she just like many of us, uh, she started her journey in India, and then she ended up in Silicon Valley as a a wife of a techie, and uh, and then she launched. Um, you know, major uh, preschool chain, uh, you know, in Bay Canada and uh, India. It's called Safari Kids. So they have 50 plus preschools about them years ago. And I know of her years ago, and I was fortunate to uh, run into her in one of the fitness clubs I go to. Um, so... Without any further ado, um, so I want to welcome Shai to our uh, podcast and ho- hopefully you guys all can learn from her. Um, I, I know I, I can. Um, so welcome, Shai. Thank you, Guru. First of all, thank you for giving me the opportunity. Uh, this is the first time on live podcast I'm going to share my story. So thank you so much for the opportunity. Then thank you to the listeners for taking the time to actually listen to my story. Um, as a basic introduction, you know, uh, just would like to say how and what kind of person I am and how I started everything in my life. I know many people, they talk about having had visions for the future as children. They set their goals and they are very disciplined to get there, right? That's not me. I just go with the flow. And most importantly is I have always followed my heart. I've always followed my heart and I've always gone with the flow. And I do believe that one experiences, uh, one experience was leading to the next, but at the same time, there were these specific defining moments in my life, which led me subconsciously to be where I am today. And I'll share that as part of my story, right? So, um, yeah, go ahead. You know, um, you know, using hard, I, you know, I come, I grew up in a village. I come from a village. Uh, I might personally also, anything I do, even uh, sports I play, people say I'm natural. You know, I run, you know, the uh, most. People, I just ran, I just ran. <laughs> I, I never had any formal uh, training. Or anything. I just ran. And, um, uh, and bottom line is that I think, you know, using heart versus using brains, I always um, get confused at times. Which one do you use there? <laughs> and uh, and you know if you have both, which you are, uh, and that's extraordinary. If you are just using brains and not having any, uh, I I would call it empathy. Being a leader, you know, is going to be difficult. And uh, if you just have empathy and if you don't have any commercial, that's also not great. So I think you have both. So I would yeah, I will let you share your story and. Uh, and then so that I can, we can talk about other things that what you are doing here uh, in the U.S. Sure. So, Guru, uh, like I said, the first time, so I'm a little bit nervous sharing my childhood story, but this is my first time sharing live on podcast about my story. So, again, thank you for the opportunity. I may pause uh, when I get nervous, but please excuse me for that. Um, so, basically, I do come from a very affluent respected, however, orthodox family in Bombay. Uh, Yes, I do choose still to call it Bombay because 
whatever memories I have, good, bad, ugly, was from Bombay. When I left, it was still Bombay. So I'll always refer to it as Bombay. Um, so I do come from a very respected family. The reason I use the word respected with so much of conviction is because right from the time I was a child, like very, very young kid, I remember my dad holding my tiny hands and walking down from the building. And we had everybody talk about fruit vendors, vegetable vendors. You know, in India, you had dosa wala. We used to have bhel puri wala, the pharmacist. Even at the bus stop, the people who are waiting to get their bus, everybody used to acknowledge my dad. There were these guys who used to actually salute my dad. And I always wondered, who is this godfather? You know, he's a father to me, but he's almost like a godfather to all these guys, right? So he was, an, he was a very, very respected uh, man in uh, Bombay, and especially in the area where we were next to Bombay Central Tardev. He was a very respected man, but I did say he was a bit orthodox as well. And so that's outside, right? Now, inside, inside a house, everything was off. You know, um, it was chaos. I would definitely define my family as a dysfunctional family. Um, things were very, very different. Now, my parents were dealing with the demons of their own. My dad had a tragic past before he married my mom. My mom had a tragic past and was forced to marry my dad at the age of 16. She was so upset because she used to always tell us she didn't even know what they did. They, I think practically drugged her or something. She was on the day of the marriage. She was sitting with a man she didn't want to marry because she was just 16 years old. She didn't want to marry at all. But whatever those tragic incidents, whatever that history behind them was, they created demons in themselves, right? There were these two different people trying to build a family together. And it was very, very, it was extremely difficult. So those are this tragic past from my parents. Having said that, it was never that, I was the victim. I always knew my parents were the victim. And the reason I knew that was my mom and dad, however awkward, however weird it was, embarrassing it was, they shared everything with their kids. We were little kids. And we used to always think, why, I said, why, why are they sharing this with me? It makes no sense, right? It's only when I became 18, 19, and I started realizing, oh my God, my parents have gone through so much in their lives, right? Uh, so my mom, there was no PG-13. There was no R-rated information in my family. Everything was shared with all the children. I grew up with uh, three of my brothers. Uh, it was hard enough to have a childhood in that house, leave alone being a girl child. Because of what my mom went through in her past life, her dad died of at an early age of tuberculosis. They were left on the streets, but he was a wealthy man. He lost 14 of his bakeries and restaurants in gambling. Uh, from that to being on the streets and being forced to marry a rich man, um, she lost faith in herself, in life and God and everything. Think about it like that, right? So that's where, uh, you know, I knew she was a victim, but all I heard as a child, as a girl child in that house was, uh, girls are daughters of devil, boys are sons of God. And that, that those things are told to us constantly in the house for a simple reason that not because they hated me, but my mom, not that she hated me or despised me being a girl. It was about her own self-esteem. She felt as a girl, I never had a voice. I was disrespectful. I was disrespected. I was taken for granted. I was, I was compromised in every aspect of my life. And just, she just felt that that's what you're going to, have to deal with your entire life. And she was so upset and despised of her life as a woman that she just felt that she sacrificed as a daughter, as a mother, as a mother-in-law, as, as a daughter-in-law, as a wife. In every aspect, she just felt her life was not pleasant. And it was visible in our home conditions inside, like I said, not outside, but the outside world. We're like this happiest, affluent, wealthy family who has best of everything, right? Nobody knew what's going on behind those uh, uh, four walls. And uh, so it, it it was really difficult. And I'm not going to shy away. Like I said, I'm going to be a little bit nervous. This is my first time, but I'm not going to shy away from saying I had a very abusive childhood, extremely, extremely abusive childhood that 
I have people who tell me even now that how did you turn out to be okay, right? So it was it was that bad. There were moments in my life as a child, I remember where I used to hide myself under the sheets, close my eyes, cringe them. And I don't know why I thought I was Jedi because school still believed you in, you know, making you believe about magic and fairy tales, right? I used to, you know, sh go under the sheets. I used to put my hands out and I don't know why I think I thought I was Jedi and I just wanted everything to pause every day of my life because my parents were both, they turned alcoholics uh, to the extent that every night there were fights and physical, mental abuse in the house with them, with the kids. And every one of us used to get involved because when two, when both parents are alcoholic, only a family that goes through it, through that experience can even, cannot even express it. It's only people who go through that kind of environment actually know it's there in your hearts, but you can never express it. Again, I would just make clear, clear, clear uh, I wanna clarify, I never was a victim. It was my parents who were the victim. I love my parents. They were strong. They were resilient. Uh, they were the nicest people. Uh, and my dad is the biggest philanthropist I knew in his times. Uh, when my dad, and that's why there was so much of respect because he helped everybody in the community, in the society. Um, he was out there for all the people who are less fortunate than us, right? And uh, I, and as a short story, like when my dad passed, he passed away at a very early age. Um, of course, alcohol does that. He passed at, at uh, he passed away at the age of fifty five at a very early age, and at his funeral. The number of people that came, there was no space for them. And my family was so upset because there were all these people, all the vendors that I was talking about, all the fruit vendors, all these people off the streets. There were uh, so many people at my dad's funeral because for them, their godfather was gone, right? Well, the reason I'm sharing it is because although he was an alcoholic and was dealing with all these negative things in his mind and became an alcoholic because that was the only way for them to mask their depression or sorrows in those days. There was no other way to let it out. But he was a very nice man. Uh, there was this guy who was, he was handicapped. You know, in India, they are those wheels. They, they roam around the streets, pushing their hands. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. This guy, because my dad may have helped him so much, but the, the, the funeral place is uphill and he could not go up. He kept sliding down. And my brother was the wow. one who got him up. He was hitting his chest and he was saying, my Godu is gone. My dad's name was Godrej. He's saying, my Godu is gone. I want to give him my last, like I want to see him for the last time. He was crying and, you know, hitting his chest. And then my brothers, they picked him and brought him for, uh, to the funeral place. So my dad was a very good man. I love and respect him from the bottom of my heart in spite of everything that we went through in our childhood, right? I just want to make that clear. Again, having said that, um, my dad was also of the mindset because he was married first at the age of 16. And then again with my mom at the age of 18, my dad wanted me to marry at the age of 16. He had made up his mind. For him, women should not study. Women should not be education because with education comes voice. With education comes power. With education comes independence. With education comes you're not going to compromise about anything. And you're going to have an unhappy marriage. So he's, he pushed me through seeing boys at the age of 16. And that was a fun phase for me because it was almost like Bollywood movies because I used to see boys and I used to make up all these wild, weird stories. So boys would reject me. And my father never understood what's happening, but it is funny stories like um, maybe some other time, but it was constantly seeing boys and rejecting them and coming up with these stories and uh, dramas and acts to you know, push boys away. So I actually enjoyed that part of my life, seeing boys <laughs> and rejecting them, not to reject them, but just to uh, be I a rebel. Right. Yeah. And that's where my journey as a rebel started. I became a rebel at that time. I was rebelling to everything. And that's when I decided because my dad doesn't want me to study and get educated, I will graduate. So that was behind my head that I, because graduation was not in my plate. That was something that was outside of me. So I decided I will graduate. When I started my college at the age of 16, I got my first uh, modeling assignment out of nowhere. This guy, Isaac, he was a choreographer. He actually picked me from the audience. 
he groomed me because everything said and not said and done because I had a lot of, I used to not have a lot of self-esteem so my body language was my my shoulders were curled my chin was down at all times till I went to college he completely changed my personality he took me to Meher Jaisya she worked with me on my posture on my balance and everything and I still remember the first show I did I won the best female model that was my first experience against all the uh, uh, professional models and everything. I won the first time, and that and that mo that trophy was given to me by Milan Soman. He was a legend wow. in the days. Yeah, okay. yes, I know him. Yeah, uh, but I was so not confident. I I tried. I practiced. I had no clue I'm going to win. So I after I finished the show, I left because there's no way I'm going to win anything at that time because there were all professionals around me. But I did win that prize. That was the day I started believing in myself that I have the confidence to do anything and everything. You know, I felt I was, I lacked a lot of self-esteem and confidence about my personality, about my own self, right? So that gave me a good start. At the age of 18, like I said, I went with the flow because I got into modeling and I saw how the production and everything happens. I was very interested in ad agency. I went and applied for an ad agency. I got the job the first day I went and applied for an ad agency. At the age of 18, while I was studying from my uh, commerce, I did my, I was working for an ad agency parallelly. Um, at the age of 19, because working for an ad agency, I started seeing the value of 2D animation, 3D animation, graphic designing and everything that became important. I went and I uh, got my two year course on, on that subject and I became a graphic designer. Uh, so everything was happening parallelly. I was modeling, I was working for an ad agency. I was uh, uh, studying for my uh, commerce. At the same time, I became a graphic designer. Everything that my heart wants, what it wants, it wanted to do everything. There was no restriction because I didn't know where my career is taking me. All I knew is I have to study to prove my dad wrong. That's all. I just wanted to buy time. But everything that came my way, I thought of it as an opportunity and I just kept working on it. At the age of 19, I met Deepak, my husband. Very simple guy, very peaceful. His aura, his demeanor is like sadhu, like pandit. And for me, that was it. I'm like, I've never seen a guy like this because in, in, in my modeling career, in an ad agency career, I met a lot of guys, right? But everybody was very like up there, arrogant and all full of themselves and everything. But Deepak was this guy, like out of nowhere, God just presented to me, it presented him to me, right? And uh, when we became very good friends and he proposed to me, I was like, this is it. This is my ticket to my goal. And my goal was no career. My goal was get out of that house. That's all I cared about. And I was like, I found the perfect guy to get me out of my house environment, right? Um, however, you know, just after proposing and a few months later, he said, Hey, I got accepted at uh, UC Berkeley. So I'm going to America. And he was really sad about it that, Oh my God, I'm, I don't know what I should do. And I'm like, dude, are you kidding me? This is a better thing to get out of, not just out of my house, but get out of the country. I don't have to face my family anymore. Get out of this environment. So I was like, that's it. Let's do it. Right. So that's how I landed in California, in Bay Area, in USA, the land of opportunities, right? Now, while he was here studying, I completed my law in India. So I also, I finished my law. I have my law degree over there. And then when I came here, I wanted to actually just give my bar exam and become a lawyer. Because remember, I was a rebel. I love to argue, right? And I had so much practicing arguing right from childhood with my parents, all my teen years and youth years. I became really good at legal stuff arguments to the extent that I never lost a single mock court in India when I was working, right? So it was it was that much of a thing that I have to be a lawyer because I'm really good at it. But there was a lot of influence being in the Bay Area. Not only him, he has a lot of family here. Everybody's in technology. And everybody was like, literally, he hates it when I use the word forced me, but everybody forced me saying, yeah, no law, you become, get into technology, you'll be really good at it. So I went, I studied at UCSC to study, I had to pay my own bills. Now, my independence started at a very young age because of my background, right? So for me, even accepting a single penny from, a, from my husband was still not acceptable to me. So to study, I started tutoring kids and I started teaching swimming. 
I think that's where my journey started as a entrepreneur because to I was working at Happy Fish for a long time. Um, I People say I have a Midas touch. I became a very good uh, swim instructor to the extent that there was such a long waiting list for people to learn under me that actually my a senior, he told me, why don't you do some private classes on uh, outside of these? So I started my own private swim school. Uh, that's where I started realizing, oh, this is good. You know, uh, I hired a few more people under my wing and we I started my own private swim classes at that time. And I was tutoring kids as well, just to pay for my tuition, because again, I didn't want to take anything from Deepak at that time. So that was my journey as I think that's where the, the journey of an entrepreneurship started for me. Um, however, and then I got a really good job right after I finished UCSC. I got a really good job job offer and a very uh, uh, reputed known uh, tech company here. We celebrated. Um, we, I had a party that night. Next day morning, I'm supposed to accept my offer. I go to sleep early morning, Deepak gets up, hugs me, congratulations, baby. This is, you know, what we've always dreamed for. We'll both have a job. We'll have a home we love and everything. And I'm like, I'm not going to take up the job. And he was like, what? He was, he still tells me that, how can you make decisions like that? I'm like, no, I'm not going to take up the job. And he said, why? And I said, you know what your dad told me at the airport? And this is like four years later. When his, his dad is a man of few words. In 25 years that I have married Deepak, he's probably spoken 50 sentences to me. That's it. That's it. He doesn't speak uh, much at all. He's a very wise man, man of few words. But and, and, and what he told me at the airport never occurred to me. That night when I went to sleep, all happily next day, I'm starting a new life, a new, you know, everything, my pathways are going to change. I don't know why what his father told me meant so much to me. His father told me at the airport, he said, Beta, each one of us are born in this life to serve our purpose. The day you figure out what your purpose in life is, he said, follow that. He said, because there are very few chosen lucky people in this world who will figure out what their purpose in life is. So if you ever figure out what your purpose in life is, he said, just follow it. And I am a person of reflection. I reflect a lot on things. But for some reason, what his dad said didn't mean as much to me that time because it's too philosophical for me. You know, newly married, all excited to come to America, leave my family. There's so many other emotions working on me, right? But what he said that day when I was reflecting, because when I sleep, I, I'm insomnic for years, uh, forever actually. Uh, so for me, when I sleep and when the lights go off, my ceiling is my whiteboard. Everything that I talk, I think, I read, or I understand, everything is reflected upon, right? So, but that reflection came to me four years, just before going and accepting the job. So there was this intersection in my life where I had to make the choice. And it was a very simple one because what my father-in-law meant so much to me, it was almost like a calling. I felt while I was studying, while I was studying, when I was tutoring these children and teaching them swimming, I just felt so good about it. And then when I was reflecting upon these things, there were other reflection points, like I told in my introduction, right? There were these experiences that led to another, and there was this subconscious inside me, right? And my subconscious are these series of stories that I'm going to share with you guys. One story is about my grandma. My grandma, and I have such vivid memory, I was very small. She used to literally hold my hand, wake me up every morning at six o'clock. And there is this temple right opposite my house and there is this basti. She used to hold my hand, she used to pick up these little kids from there every day, five or six kids. We used to hold a chain, walk to my house and she used to tutor them every morning. Not tutor them in all the subjects, but she used to teach them basic English sentences. I still remember times table. I was a pro at it because I, we've been taught that our, our whole life because she used to tutor spelling. I was so good at spelling, like so good at spelling. But after coming to this country and with spell check and all, I don't know where everything is gone, but I was really good at that because my grandma used to teach that. So I do believe subconsciously that was there somewhere in my subconscious that made me determine what I want to do in my life. 
also because i was this very dirty unkempt child in school because i was an absolutely neglected abused child i didn't know when to shower my hair was never combed and i went to a private school like a private british school things are very different so all these girls and a girl school uh they can be really mean in school kids can be really mean nobody wanted to play with me nobody wanted to sit next to me so i've always felt like uh i felt invisible at i wanted to be invisible at home but in school i felt i was invisible people didn't want to associate people didn't want to do anything with me because of my condition the way i was right uh however because of that i started forming my own group when i was in 7th grade i formed my own group with little kids in my school so all the way from first second third grade i started calling these children and there was this one area uh, in the playground in my school which was a stage which was a platform and i used to tell i used to actually solicit these children little ones and i used to tell them you know i'll do some games with you we'll play some games so i used to play simon says dog in the bone all these little games and my group started becoming bigger and bigger and bigger i do feel that's when my journey of entrepreneurship started because working with children at that and i was a child myself i was still in 7th grade but i was working with these young children to the extent that some students complained to my teacher saying that i was occupying a lot of space below there and uh, i was disrupting their uh, games out there but my teachers when they heard my story the way i felt in school rather than telling me stop what you're doing because that's irregular and nobody does that my teachers actually said you know what shadukt have your space i will talk to the students who have objections with your space and those are my seniors and so my teacher actually let me be with those kids and my group started becoming bigger and bigger i think that subconsciously was there somewhere i've always worked with children um you know when i was in 10th grade 9th and 10th grade i used to teach art to a lot of kids in my colony in my society uh my school also gave a lot of opportunity for me in elocution and drama and everything although the students the girls didn't give me the opportunity my teachers did give me a lot of opportunity participating in all these things and i do believe that that really strengthened my personality somewhere although it did not evolve till i got my that first modeling uh, 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 award but it was there somewhere it was building inside me right and that's why you know what my father in law said that day was actually a trigger point for me because all these in my subconscious was already there what i wanted to do um uh, it was just what he said just make sense it was almost like a calling and it was like girl this is what you need to do this is where your true passion is and when i say passion guru till today i tell my husband i have never woken up one single day not liking what i do i love what i do i am so passionate because i feel believe my passion is towards a purpose purpose of educating children and these early years are such important years in the child's life the most reformative years they can you know make or break a child you know if these these um, connections that we talk about in early childhood education if they are not made they are pruned forever right so how important is early years is the most important years in your child's life and we want to safari kid or any preschool industry you know how noble that is we are taking up the responsibility yeah. of building those children right so for me that became a very strong purpose like i said i love what i do because it's a very big responsibility and just seeing how safari kid has evolved and seeing how these children and alumni is the way they are today and i'm still in contact with my first second and third batch it's just the most pleasant the most noble and the most achieving thing in my life to me that is success you know so yeah yeah i did tons of podcast uh i mean i was in tears when you were explaining some of those things um I never had a story like this. This is probably the first one. I think we need we need another podcast to cover <laughs> the stuff I need to cover. I'm I'm not kidding. Uh, so 
So right now, I want to ask one question before we get into other things. Like, I think you already touched upon it, right? So the industry you are in is very, very, very crucial for any human being. You are, you are making a difference in a, you know, infant or a very young child uh, for Absolutely. a, you know, for a, you know, bright future, uh, you know, you know, for them. So the key, the, but, you know, if you look at the, the way things evolved since our days, right? You know, there is this social media, smart devices, now AI, and, you know, everything is pulling these kids, you know, in, in a way, in two, multiple directions. Like some of the things you mentioned about some of the words used, you know, being abused, you know, you know, different things that were there back in the day, those can be somehow contained if we, you know, somehow if we recognize them ahead of time with, with everything that's going on right now at the speed at which it's going on. For instance, somebody gets on the smartphone and finds some dude somewhere, some creepy guy and God knows what's happening. We don't even know. I know there are parent controls, et cetera, but long story short, we hear all the, uh, these stories all the time. My, 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 my uh, you know, question to you is based on your story, you know, what do you tell the young kid, you know, somewhere who may be going through some, some of the stuff you went through or somebody who wants to do certain things, you know, that, that get them going? Like you said, right? I get up in the morning. I'm so happy about what I do. That is a gift. That is a gift from the God, in my humble opinion. If you like what you do, if you are surrounded by people that like you or you like them, what else do you want in life? And then good food, I guess. You will get that anyway in, in Bay Area. So, uh, so my, my, my question is, you know, how do you package this? And then what do you suggest some of these young folks that are coming into this, this uh, the, you know, wild world and to figure their, their strengths and what works for them, right? You are able to figure that out somehow, somewhere. You understood who you are, what works best for you. You are able to figure it out. That's why you are enjoying it. If, if somebody is not, then if somebody cannot figure that out, they end up leading very mediocre life. When I say mediocre, not necessarily money. Everything, right? The, the happiness and the drive, and you know, then obviously money, right? Uh, money is going to follow, and everything is going to be mediocre. This is the point of freedom to learn. My podcast is to provide these young guys the ability to understand who they are, what best, what works best for them. So, just share your thoughts. I know it's it's a it's a lot, but I just wanted to, yeah, I you know get a opportunity for audiences to learn from you basically that's the idea so guru um the question was multiple folds but it um what the way i can i can express my story right and if that helps the audience and that's the reason why although i was nervous i wanted to share my story because everybody's life is not perfect it's not that everybody out there who's an entrepreneur or a successful person they have the best background or the best stories. It's how you make the best of it, right? So even whatever stages in life you've gone through, ups and downs, first of all, the most important thing I learned is like, and I mentioned that because I want listeners, anybody out there who's going through or went through these struggles to understand the moment you make yourself a victim of anything, it's not going to work for you. That's right. In most conditions, you are never the victim. You are the result of people who are victims, right? Oh. Who have been abused or had bad childhood or bad stages in marriage. It's not that people are bad. It's their circumstances are bad. So this, the, like what I feel really helped me is the communication that my parents had with me. The way they treated us, they had justification. I know nothing can justify that. I tell my mom, nothing justifies the way you were treating us. But somewhere, it was not in a control. They could not control because there was no help. There was no one to help them. The only help was alcohol, right? So my point is, wow. for you know, it's first of all, make sure this, you communicate. 
understand, never put yourself as a victim in any position. The moment you put yourself as a victim, right there, you've lost your battle, right? That's correct. So yep. I think that was the most important thing for me, always fighting that I'm not the victim, my parents are the victim because I knew their stories, right? Second most important thing I think is, you know, we people talk about opportunities, knock at your door, go accept it. I have never seen it like that. For me, I just felt I created opportunities for myself, right? In any situation and every situation, I never went with the norm. I never felt bad how people spoke about me because when you have your, uh, you know, I had my commerce degree, I had my LLB degree, I had my networking degree over here, everything I had. And when I went and actually said, no, I'm not going to do this. I'm going to go become a teacher. And I didn't even become a teacher. I became a teacher's aide. And my only responsibility was changing diapers and feeding those kids. It was almost like a taboo. And for me, it was a noble thing that I was doing, right? In my heart, okay, maybe I was a rebel, but I truly wanted to pursue this. Although there was so much of backlash I got from my family saying that, what the heck are you doing? You have so much of education and you're going to go become a teacher like it's a bad thing. And for me, that was the most precious thing to do, right? I never cared about that noise because somewhere if you know who you are, if yeah. you believe, because belief is your own. You can believe in what you want to believe, nobody else. If you believe in what you want to do, what you are or what you want to achieve, everything else should be noise for you and start removing noise out of your life, right? And then if you are disciplined enough, in the beginning, I wasn't disciplined, frankly. I just went with the flow, followed my heart. But once my heart knew what it wanted and once my heart was on the track, I was very disciplined in getting what I wanted to get in every phase of my life, right? As an entrepreneur. So I think the best advice is that, that if you believe in something, first is if you ever figure out what your purpose is, go for it, right? Secondly, if you believe in something, filter out all the noise. You don't need that. Go for it. You know, like, like somebody had interviewed me and I said, I'm a Nike, just do it. You know, yeah. just you need to just go ahead and do it. The moment you analyze, you paralyze a lot of things in life. And I'm a person, again, because I go with my heart, I go a lot with my instincts. Everything is very instinct based. I create opportunities around me for every circumstance or everything that I want to achieve. It's a very conscious decision to create that opportunity for me. I do not believe in depending on if there is an opportunity, go for it, because I have never got that. Right. Uh, second uh, and most important thing is, yeah, social media. I mean, it, social media is good. It's important. Everybody's loving it. AI. I use a lot of AI tools today. I'll be very frank. But there are so many negative aspects Correct. to it as that as an educator, as a care provider, as a person who believes that my purpose in life is a responsibility towards these kids, I feel there is so much information that's doctorated. There's so much that is wrong out there. That's so much that's yeah. influencing these children in the wrong manner. It's, it's forming them in the wrong manner. It's made their belief system is skewed. Everything is so skewed that I believe these children, are they their own individual? Do they even have their own identity? I bet to differ, absolutely not, right? So for me, actually, this especially social media, AI, I see a lot of help. But with the social media, the information that's out there and the way it's making children feel today, the youth, I've been seeing so many youth around me just in my environment, which is a very small environment. The number of youth that are suffering because of social media, Guru, it's, it's a shame. Like, I, if I had the button... I would just switch it off. Turn it off. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And, and it's difficult for these youth to actually analyze that and realize what's doing to them because it's all about the whole world is happier than me. The whole world is more beautiful than my world around me. They are putting themselves in the bubble because everything <laughs> there is not true. Yeah. People only, it's, it's, it's like Yelp, right? You will only go and write things if you have negative experience. If you have 10 good experience and one negative experience with an organization, you will go and write about the negative. Social media is exactly the opposite. Everything beautiful out of 
hundred percent, ten percent of the day is good, then ninety percent of the day is bad, or ten percent of the day, and that's influencing these children. And children are getting more and more depressed. Children are getting more and more anxiety. Children are getting more and more into that box that their life is not as great as it should be. But that's not true, right? It, frankly, as an educator, it really bothers me, Guru. It's a very sensitive topic for me. Sorry, I get it, but I'm just very, um, I just get very passionate with anger that how social media is affecting the youth today. Youth will hate me for saying this, uh, but it's they just don't realize the the consequences and sequences that are going to follow for them. Personally, again, that's my belief system. No, no, I don't think they'll hate you. Trust me, it, it, they are also coming around. I, I speak to a lot of young folks, uh, college students and high school students. Even they starting to believe that this thing is spinning out of control, even for them. And, and there's the peer pressure reached the peak. You know, some kid did something on Instagram and I have to do it. Why? Because he did it or she did it and I just have to do it. And, you know, it, it just, it's crazy. But first of all, I want to, like I said before, I want to have a, a separate podcast on safari Okay. <laughs> so the Good. reason being, because, because that itself has a lot of depth and you put in so much time and it's very successful organization. And uh, I want people to learn, uh, you know, the passion behind what you're doing. And obviously how you're doing to the extent that you can share. And uh, more importantly, how that's going to, you know, transform these kids into, you know, better citizens going forward. Right? That's, the, that's the goal. So, you know, you know, because with the time, you know, first of all, I, like I said before, this is incredible. Your story is, if you ask me, you should go on uh, as a motivational speaker on one of these talks. Uh, no, I'm serious. In TED Talks or Ink Talks. In fact, I do. Uh, Ink Talks CEO was on my podcast. I, I, I mentioned to her about you, by the way. But I'll make an introduction when, when time comes. She's in, in California at the moment, but she travels a lot. You guys should connect. And then you should be a speaker uh, in one of her uh, conferences, in my humble opinion. So long story, I mean, I guess going back to our podcast, um, you know, like certain priorities, right? Like you said, yes, you went with, in the beginning, you went with the flow and then, you know, you, somehow you ended up being a model, by the way. <laughs> People dream of being models, especially in Bombay. There are so many foreign, foreign citizens hanging out in Bombay to become models. You know that most probably you might have come across a bunch of them. And you ended up being one of them and you won the competition. Everything. That's just crazy. And then and then you ended up at UC Berkeley, which your husband. And then you are in Bay Area, one of the best places in the world, in my opinion. Best weather, best everything in my house. You know, and then here itself. you are. Uh, we should be a country by itself. <laughs> yes. And then, no, with all due respect, whenever I travel, the problem with the weather is because we are so spoiled here. I can't take weather in South India when I go. I mean, it's so humid. And and if you were in Florida or Texas, it's easier to adjust to those weather conditions. So, and you're running one of the, in, from my knowledge, one of the best organizations. And it, it has a good name. I, 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 I've been watching this for years now. And, um, you, know, you know, you transform something that, traditionally people say as a something negative into a completely positive if I look at it from outside, right? So that itself is a, a lesson for a lot of people, you know, trying to build their careers as we speak. Um, so that's the reason I was saying, I want to take Safari Kids and how you started and where it is at, where you want this to be. I want to have a separate podcast just for that. And um, and then right now I have the last question for this podcast, and then we'll continue. It's a sequel. Um, you know there is a there is a you know gap between like you, now your kids are going to colleges, and we talk about your son or the other day. So there is a gap between academics and the real world. The real world is what you you know probably you have seen that even before you went to the real world, but 
there is a life skills, right? There are life skills, and there are skills that are being taught in schools. Um, there is a lot of emphasis on the uh, the skills that you learn in schools, and almost zero emphasis, in my opinion, very less emphasis on actual life skills, things like, you know, fitness, mental, physical, and you know, understanding uh, basic finance, uh, basic finance, like you know, what is investment means, you know. What is the difference between richness and wealth? Things of that nature. All those things, uh, you know. For you know, they expect you to do MBA to learn finance. Uh, you know, um, uh, how do you learn so many things? Right? You go and do beta computer science. You go and do MBA, and then you go and do medicine. You're done. You you will be like fifty year old by the time you finish all your degree. So, how do you you know like you know there is a gap, right? How do you you know, I, I, how do you, I mean, what's your advice to these kids to address those life skills? And then when they get out of these academics, your kids, my kids, what really matters is having these, uh, you know, life skills, like simple communication, reading the room, the ability to understand, you know, whether this is going to work out for me or not. All those skills are not being taught and they cannot be taught using textbook. You need some kind of a, you know, learn by doing type uh, platforms. Right. So, so is there anything that you can add to, you know, uh, those things for these kids to, uh, you know, uh, take care of themselves? I don't, I mean, with all due respect, none of these colleges are going to teach and they have to figure it out on their own. So, that's, share that's anything a, that comes to your mind. Yeah, that's a very good question, but that's a very difficult question because of the, pub, the school system and the f fundings and everything. Right. So, that's a separate topic. Um, however, I completely agree. I'm so glad you're bringing this question because that bothers me as well. Again, as an educator, right? You know, when our children are in preschool, we have a curriculum component that talks about empathy, compassion, communication, the importance of communication, body language, sign language. We teach them through little stories and examples and you know acting out in class the teacher does with puppets and everything right so we teach them all these basic skill sets in preschool when they come to elementary school and beyond i mean kids are done i mean so, so certain school districts better than the other they do great job with math and ela you know all the other subjects out there right uh but to your point what about simple thing like non verbal communication do you know when two people talk, they say around 80%, this is somewhere I read, 80% of the communication is nonverbal. Who teaches them that in school? That is the most important pointer and a cursor for you when you go for a job interview or when you're building your own self-esteem and your life, right? What about, so there's so many soft skills, but what about stuff like, you know, relationship management? I mean, just like my example, I could not have a single friend because I was unkempt, right? But what about children here? What about the relationships? I have heard of so many children going through depression because they're part of these groups. And then they start exploring in high school that, hey, let's split up the group. And because one person in the group wants to split up, the whole group splits, splits up. And I've seen them in close family and friends. Kids are going through that kind of depression. Where is the value of friendship? And if you want to explore, it's okay. But there is a way to do that for everybody, right? So relationship, non-verbal communication, basic communication, uh, self-esteem, uh, confidence. Uh, there is so much more that a school could teach to these children, which is completely missing in our system. Most importantly, uh, Guru, my, again, again, these are all my personal beliefs, right? For example, look at the number of children because of the pandemic. So there was one out of every three children, uh, uh, one out of every four children are going through depression and social anxiety. I don't know if you know about that. Wow. So pandemic, that number is gone. No, no, one out of every three children somewhere I read. Then wow, that's the pandemic, that's yeah. in by 25%. Okay. Now think, and again, as an educator and being, you know, in this industry, I'm constantly surrounded by these youths at all times. When I see what these children are going through, and that's just a very sensitive topic for me as well. It is really sad because people don't understand what they're going through. 
basic thing that a school system should have is, you know what, according to me, again, my belief system, basic thing on how to recognize a child who's going through social anxiety in a classroom, for them to recognize that child, for that child to, you know, they have sex education in school, right? Which is great. It's important, right? Just like that, they should have some sort of mental health education in school where they not, not, not only talk about these children, but how other children should behave towards these children. When a child is going through depression or social anxiety or OCD or any kind of these mental health uh, issues, there is a way these children have to be handled within a classroom. These children are not accepted and that's the biggest issue. And that's why they're going more and more deeper, deeper, deep inside, right? For teachers, teachers don't know how to handle these kids. Teachers are putting yes. social anxiety in a big debate class and asking them and grading them based on that. I think it's not an equal platform for these children that they should be on the same level doing with other children who are suffering from these kind of anxiety or any kind of mental health issues, right? I just feel school system should adopt to that. Another very important thing, I'll tell you my son's story. He's a fashion designer, right? He's a very creative guy. Um, and there were these schools that he wanted to apply. And the minimum requirement was 3.9 GPA to even apply for that, those schools. And he had the 3.7 GPA, but he's an extremely creative guy, touch wood. And I was shocked when I read his essay. He actually borrowed an essay saying that, you know, you guys are a creative school and you're looking at the creative aspect in a person. How is it fair that you guys are measuring us based on academic achievement and there's nothing to do with creative achievement with our GPA? Then on what basis does a 3.9 GPA justify to a creative person like me, right? That's what a GPA should encompass everything, yeah. not just yeah. those skill sets. So I think there's a lot of, frankly, there's a lot of gap happening. Uh, you're talking about finance and everything else, um, like a management courses. I think if a child is developed in all domains well, you know, there's a physical domain, there, uh, there is a language domain, literacy domain, uh, there is, uh, uh, sorry, there's cognitive domain, uh, there is health yeah. domain, there are so many domains out there. If the curriculum is, is well designed to encompass all those development in each of these domains, you don't have to teach them in any of these aspects to be a good leader or to be a good team player it'll automatically happen because it's all about communication, right. relationship building, resilience, authenticity. Authenticity is so huge. What is social media doing? Social media has completely stripped up authenticity out of everybody's lives. And mass yep. is a completely different version, right? So yep. Yep. all of those things need to be added. Now that's a, I mean, I could have a podcast on that. That's such a sensitive topic. Uh, when it comes to children and education, there's so many things that is missing. I agree. There's so much that can be done, but as an individual, sometimes you feel so helpless. Like you want to do things and nobody's even giving you a ear for it, right? So thank you for, you know, uh, giving me this opportunity and a platform and hope listeners and someone out there, you know, attributes towards this, right? So first of all, thank you very much. This thank is you. invaluable to the audiences, myself included, by the way, I'm also learning. So... I mean, in short, I have also have a bunch of pet peeves. Like we can list out 50 things. And like you said, these schools are branded. And they, you know, when I say schools, I mean, I'm generally I'm talking about colleges. They're all branded regardless of, you know, what it is. You know, we are sending our kids to them and we pay big, big money. And, and then, you know, they get out. And then they, this insanity is you try the same thing. And then expect different results. I went through a college system. I know I have seen my classmates, myself, how we did and where we are, how much it helped me and everything. I know my, my kids are going through it now. Am I doing any differently? No. But I want a different results. I want my son to be a CEO of the company. How is that going to happen? And, and because we put through the same system, which was not taking care of any of those, for instance, Mental condition of simple things like meditation, right? I'm not saying that, you know, you know, you know, maybe at least high no, school and above. Important. Meditation is something. See, if I don't get 35 marks or whatever, 40, 35 marks, 40 marks in math, they used to say I have to repeat the degree because I failed. Why, if I don't do 20 push ups, I pass the exam? <laughs> yeah. I mean, I know they never asked me to do a workout, they never asked me, did you meditate? 
if you if i don't show proof that i didn't meditate or you have a exam you come with the mats and do the meditation and then if i do it i pass otherwise you don't have degree there is no such thing uh, apparently i don't know why that's not important right now majority of you 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 we, we both see in the club a lot of people they did fairly well in other things they are struggling to you know take care of their mental or physical health and and now they don't even know how to do it till day people are trying to figure diet what to eat still people don't know what to eat and myself included every day is a struggle i'm a vegetarian so long story short there's so many life skills like some of the ones you mentioned i i, I was thinking about it there's a huge laundry list my hope with our platform also which you know i built as a company uh, and and with this podcast is to make these young guys understand the priorities okay, the, once you understand the priorities you know that okay, i have to be on right diet it's okay you might make few mistake but you will even should get on the track if you have no clue about what the right diet is or or if you have no clue that you have to be on the right diet then you are going to lose 30 40 years of your life one fine morning you realize and then you sign up for a gym membership and then you go and then do twice it nothing is going to change so <laughs> that's what a lot of people do a lot of my friends they come on january 1st to the gym again next year they'll come yeah. on january 1st <laughs> so i i asked them why don't you cancel the membership you are wasting money they say oh if i cancel it i feel like i'm not part of fitness club <laughs> so they want that uh, you know feeling on 680 uh, that i am part of the fitness club that never show so with that i'm going to um, you know i want to thank you so much for being I'm here on the podcast and like i said i want to i know you're a very busy person i know but we want to do another one few mainly on the uh, safari kids and uh, you know social media and some of the topics we identified today so we'll have another podcast i'll come up with the format and everything but let's do it again i really really appreciate your oh, thank time thank you today. so much i appreciate you giving me the opportunity and just uh, to end this uh, uh, guru you know you mentioned about gym and everything right how important physical health is i just want to you know end this by saying you know people with pride say i go to the gym at least right <laughs> when it comes to mental health <laughs> everybody is ashamed of it there is nothing yeah. it's equally important as physical health right a uh, physical health at least you see what's wrong with you you take medicine you're okay with this mental health if it just spirals is going to take you to a place you know it's going to be hard to return and it 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 defeats everything and it ruins people's lives right so my request to the listeners and you you know everybody whoever's listening to this is you know physical health is health is very very important health it should be your priority in life you know they say health is wealth i say health is everything right everything. Uh, but at the same time please give importance to mental health especially in today's right. world with so much of change that is happening with social media and everything around you please focus and don't be ashamed or embarrassed to go and ask for help if yep. something not working in your surrounding for you simple thank you so much really appreciate it thank you i mean in fact to add to that like even to go to therapists sometimes people they either they're over confident or like you said they're ashamed of approaching therapists i don't think it's anything wrong even the big you know best of the best have a therapist it's Absolutely. always it's okay to go and then talk to somebody and get this thing over with and whatever the thing that is bothering them and you are absolutely right if they don't disclose nobody will know it's very dangerous yes. thing and on that note again i want to thank you and then uh, i will be in touch uh, for the second podcast <laughs> thank you so much have a wonderful day bye yeah, thank, thank you. you bye yeah thanks yeah